Hello everybody. If you clicked on this video, you are probably interested in generator sheds or ways to quiet a generator. And you may have watched from my previous videos about uh, how I built a quiet generator shed and how I turned a, an old trash can into a pretty effective generator muffler. So if you haven't watched those, take a look at the description and I have links for those previous videos there. I originally only made the shed video because my, my build turned out pretty good, but I guess 100,000 views later and a couple other folks are interested in that information as well. So that's why I put this video together to kind of go over some of the updates that I've made since that first video, some of the upgrades that I've done on the shed and on the muffler, and to address some of the frequently asked questions that people have asked me uh, over the last few months about those videos. So um, I was going to do an overview of the old design, what I've updated in the meantime, uh, go over a parts list of what I have in the current uh, muffler and uh, some of the upgrades that I did to the shed, and then go over what's next. So let's move on. So the original muffler, which I'll call version one or gen one, had a one inch diameter pipe. Um, the original exhaust on the uh, generator that I have is one inch. So at the time I thought it was sufficient, but it, in retrospect I got quite a bit of feedback that a one inch diameter pipe probably wasn't enough. Um, all of this is, is one inch uh, inlet here, one inch pipe, a one inch uh, 90 degree bend, and all of this perforated pipe is, is a two inch. But the original design was based off of the idea of a motorcycle exhaust, which the exhaust goes through a perforated pipe and there are holes which let the sound energy out into some insulation, in this case, usually fiberglass, and that absorbs some of the sound. Um, so it quiets it down without offering too many restrictions to the exhaust um, so that performance isn't affected. So the original design has the uh, exhaust coming into the muffler, which I called the Franken muffler. It goes through a one inch pipe, does a 90 degree turn, goes down through a perforated pipe, and the rest of this garbage can is filled with insulation, specifically mineral wool or rock wool insulation that is not only a, a good sound deadener, but it is also fireproof up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit which I wanted to make sure that this was a safe muffler, not just an effective sound deadening muffler. So the main problem becomes uh, the one inch pipe itself. Uh, when you get a lot of uh, length on an exhaust pipe and it's uh, a very narrow diameter, you can get a lot of back pressure into the uh, cylinder of the generator itself. So you might notice that if you ever blow air out of a straw, it's short and it's straight and there's not much resistance. But if you try to blow into a garden hose that's long and curved, it has a lot of resistance because air does have mass. And you don't want too much back pressure or else the exhaust can't easily leave the cylinder head in the generator. And that affects your efficiency of the generator and also generates quite a bit of heat. So my idea um, in the long run was to make this a little more efficient, make this pipe a little bigger and um, make it more efficient. So that's where we were going with this. So again, with the original design, um, I had a one inch flexible hose coming from the generator, goes out through the side of the shed through a, uh, a pipe floor flange and it went through this one inch pipe into the muffler and you saw what the inside of the muffler looked like. So this has a few curves to it. It's pretty long. Uh, I wasn't ever going to keep it that long, um, but I did originally end up raising the generator up on these big tires for several other reasons. Um, and that sort of changed where the outlet for the shed needed to be. And I never actually shortened this hose. So that made a lot of length and a lot of curves, which added to more back pressure. Additionally, um, the outlet for the muffler on that generator was only a one inch inside diameter. So 
the easiest way I found to attach something to it was to tap it for three quarter inch pipe thread and threading a three quarter inch pipe nipple into it. Then I could put a three quarter inch pipe connector and another piece of three quarter inch pipe, which I sort of beveled down, and I could slide this uh, flexible hose over the top. Um, that worked, but this does reduce this outlet to three quarters of an inch instead of an inch. So that was a bit of a restriction. And again, all of the length of this pipe, the curve of the pipe, the restriction here to three quarter inch would contribute to the back pressure of the the whole system and make the generator here run less efficiently. So on to version two. These are the upgrades that I wanted to do to make the generator run a little bit better, um, reduce that back pressure on the cylinder head itself, and make the generator breathe a little bit easier so I could maximize the power that I got out of the generator and just make it more efficient overall. So what I did was I took the one inch pipe and I upgraded the whole system to a two inch pipe. The two inch pipe isn't just twice as big, it's actually four times as big. Um, it's twice as tall and twice as wide, so it's really got four times the area. If you want to check that out, you can use the pi r squared cross section for a circle, and you can see that the two inch pipe is actually four times the cross section of a one inch pipe. So not only is it a larger diameter pipe, but it's a straighter shot. I put the outlet for the shed at the same level as the um, outlet for the exhaust, and it's a straight shot, and it's much shorter than the version up here at the top. So uh, all of those are good uh, with respect to making the exhaust breathe easier. The other thing that I did was inside the muffler, I upgraded the parts so that they're also, also two inch um, uh, in, in diameter, and the curve is much more gradual than that really abrupt 90 degree turn. Otherwise, the muffler is just the same. It's got the same rock wool insulation uh, inside the muffler. And uh, I also added some additional rock wool to the bottom of this uh, uh, floor of the shed. You can see originally I didn't have any rock wool on the floor. I thought this might be good not only for sound deadening, but also for heat protection since, again, the rock wool can stand more temperatures than the plastic can. So the other thing that I did was I exchanged the floor flanges that I had in the wall, which tended to transfer a little bit too much heat to the plastic shed. And I replaced that with a three inch class B vent. So this is a double wall vent. And that seems to do a much better job of keeping the heat away from the plastic of the shed itself. All right, so let's take a look at the internals of the muffler itself. For comparison, I have the original pipe up here. Uh, this is the one inch pipe with the uh, 90 degree elbow. And this is the new part that I have that's all two inch pieces. Uh, here's the original view of the one inch pipe and how it makes the 90 degree turn down into the perforated pipe. And here's a view of this piece. Uh, this used some slightly different pieces, but this has a much more gradual turn. It's a two inch diameter, but it's a four inch radius instead of about a half inch radius on the other uh, elbow up here. So this fits in the same amount of space. I did have to trim back some of the rock wool that I used at the top here so that it would fit snugly. And here's a side view of how it comes in and the pieces that I used, which I'll get into later. I'll have a parts list of the things that I used. So. Basically, the whole internals of the muffler are now two inch. Uh, again, this perforated pipe was two inches originally, but this piece was one inch. So I removed those restrictions. So in the shed itself, uh, I upgraded the original tiny little one inch um, diameter flexible pipe and the three quarter inch pipe that I used to connect to the um, muffler in the generator to uh, a one inch pipe that's welded to the generator muffler. Um, and then immediately it grows to a two inch pipe through a, it's called a reduction bushing, 
but it's a one inch to two inch, um, and then the rest of it is two inches all the way out. Uh, down here in the bottom corner, I have the new system up here at the top. Um, this is the whole flexible pipe um, and all the pieces that go on it. Uh, here's the three inch uh, Class B vent, the double walled vent. Um, and here's actually a brand new spark arrestor setup that I set up. It has a much larger spark arrestor than the original one, which is down here. It's a tiny little um, screen that was used in the original one. And you can also see that the length of this pipe is much shorter than the original pipe that I used um, on the other one. Um, I was originally going to cut this length down to just what I needed, but since I was going to upgrade everything, I never did cut that. Up here at the top, you can see the individual parts, which I'll go into later, and which you can see if you want to replicate something like this, uh, what the parts actually are. And I'll get into that later. This is mostly for comparison to see the order that things were put together and compare it to the old one. And you can see it's much, much bigger. So again, here's another comparison of how I attach things to the uh, generator muffler itself um, in the generator. At the top here is the old version, which I already kind of went into. This is a three quarter inch pipe and I've threaded the interior of the muffler um, outlet itself to screw it in there. Um, and then I put these pieces on. The new version um, is actually welded on. You can see the weld right here. I just took it down to a local muffler shop and they, they welded it on there for about 30 bucks. It's not the prettiest thing, but it works pretty well and it's nice and solid. Um, the main reason I did this was because I can use this threaded pipe to attach multiple things to the exhaust. So I can do the extended pipe and flexible pipe that I'm using for a muffler shed and I can also put a spark arrestor on it, or I could do various things um, and attach it here, and this is a nice, sturdy way to do it. Uh, here's a side view. Another good thing about welding the one-inch pipe to the muffler in the generator is that it actually clears the stock heat shield of the generator muffler itself, um, so I didn't have to cut this. I didn't have to take this off. This muffler does get very hot, um, just under standard testing, not even really under load, this thing will get in the 300 to 350 range pretty easily, um, especially right right here, it gets very hot. Um, so you have to be careful about that and having that heat shield there definitely helps so that you don't reach in there and burn your hand or something because that is very hot. The next thing that I do is I screwed on to this piece, I did the reduction bushing um, even though I'm using it as an expander, it's actually called a reduction bushing. And this goes from one inch to two inch. So the next thing uh, we see here is a, another view of that two inch reduction bushing. And then I use a two inch um, conduit coupling, is what uh, that's called. Uh, it worked a little better than a coupling for a two inch pipe. It's just a little cleaner. And then the next thing that I put on is a compression fitting, and this is also for conduit, uh, which I found was a little snugger than a similar thing uh, that would have a set screw. Um, you might see that in some of these pictures that I took when it was older. So um, here's an end view, and you can clearly see the one inch pipe expands to a two inch pipe. So that's what we're going for. So. Uh, there's no restriction here coming out of the exhaust. It was originally one inch anyway, so there's no restrictions there. Um, and we go directly to that two inch, which was the goal of everything anyway. The, these pieces here, this one and this one, are actually, like I said, conduit pieces. You'll also hear them referred to EMT or electric metallic tube, um, which they use for conduit for wiring. Um, it seems to work pretty good for this application. Um, it's still metal, so it should withstand the heat. Um, theoretically, the heat out of this one should get up to potentially 600 degrees Fahrenheit, so uh, I didn't want anything in there that would, um, you know, wouldn't stand at least 600 degrees. So um, this pipe right here just kind of shoves in there, and um, you tighten this 
uh, screw right here and it kind of clamps down on the tube. All right, so next. Inside of the muffler, uh, I had a choice. That original uh, elbow right here, which you can see, uh, which was just a one inch uh, 90 degree pipe elbow, was really abrupt, so that causes a lot of back pressure. So I wanted to make that more gradual. A lot of people suggested that I do a two inch conduit uh, elbow, which is much more gradual so that wires will go around that corner. But if you can see up here, this is a two inch conduit um, 90 degree elbow and it's huge. So if I actually went in up, up at this level and it made the, the corner, it would end somewhere down here and it wouldn't have a lot of room for sound muffling uh, for that perforated pipe. So I couldn't really do that even if I cut it off say about here It still uses almost half of the muffler um, At the other extreme I could have used a two inch pipe elbow instead of the one inch pipe elbow It's a little more gradual especially on the outside, but I thought that was also a little too abrupt so I went the middle ground and I found this um, two inch exhaust tube that has a four inch radius so that that's the radius of this this arc right here um, and I ended up cutting it off about here and this is the end product uh, it's probably more like up here um, and that you can see the curve of this piece right here that's a lot more gradual and it was small enough so that it it ended somewhere around up here so I have all of this room here for um, sound insulation for that perforated pipe and a lot more surface area to absorb the sound energy. So that was my thinking and why I didn't go with the really big one and why I didn't go with the really little one. And I ended up finding a piece that was somewhere in the middle. So here's the piece I actually used. Um, I'll list it later as well. So the next thing uh, is just another view of how I fit the pieces together. Uh, these are all the two inch pieces. Um, I had to recut um, some of this rock wool that I used in the top and the bottom. Um, the whole middle of the garbage can is actually a batting style um, insulation that's mineral wool as well. Um, and then at the top and the bottom I used this rigid stuff that I used for the shed um, because it would retain its shape and I could control uh, pretty precise, precisely where things landed. Um, I ended up using a slightly different piece here um, uh, at the end, this is a set screw connector, and I ended up using a compression connector just because it had a better fit, but this one would work as well. Um, these are just different views. And eventually I put one more piece of rock wool on top of here to cover this. I did have to, have to cut a little channel and a little notch out for these uh, set screws here, but it just sets on top of this and is pretty much flush with the top of the garbage can so that it had a nice seal. Um, so that the exhaust wouldn't come back up here and come out through here and up through the, the top of the lid, which can be a problem if you don't have a tight fit. All right, so I had mentioned before a spark arrester. The stock spark arrester, which I had built into a couple little connectors up here, is really tiny and doesn't have a whole lot of surface area because it was meant to fit in that one inch outlet of the stock muffler on the generator. So what I did was I built this really big piece using a motorcycle spark arrestor screen, which you can see here. This particular one happens to be from Lex, and I had it sitting around from another motorcycle project. But I did end up grinding um, this lip down here to about 56 millimeters, which is about the size of the inside of this um, set screw connector. So it would set right up against that little um, ledge inside the, the connector there. And then I would put the screen in, and then I cut a little piece of two inch conduit, which I shove in there to hold it on, and then I screw down these screws, and it holds this conduit in place, which holds the screen in place. And then I use a, a conduit connector here, kind of as the body, this piece right here, of the, the piece. And this will actually screw on to that reduction bushing that comes out of the muffler itself. So this will just screw on um, to the generator itself when I take it out into the woods and I don't want uh, you know to set the woods on fire. 
So a lot of uh, uh, locations on public lands require that you have spark arresters on, say, motorcycles, ATVs, and even generators. So this way I'm covered. In kind of an expensive way to build a spark arrestor, but I've seen worse ways to do it. Um, you might say that the spark arrestor is adding some restriction to the flow, but not a whole lot, because even though this piece is slightly under two inches, there's a lot of surface area, so the, the airflow kind of comes through here, and it has a lot of room to come through this screen, and uh, it stops the little uh, hot metallic sparks you might get if you have you know, a backfire or something from from your internal combustion engine and keeps it from shooting out through the exhaust and setting things on fire. So I thought it was important that I do build a spark arrestor and that it be uh, matched to the new two inch exhaust. So that's why I took the time to do it. All right, so let's uh, take a look um, at what the actual results were. If you watched any of my earlier videos, again, take a look at the links in the description. Um, you'll see that I did some pretty extensive testing with a sound meter to show um, where the, the kind of the hot spots were as far as sound and um, how loud things were. Um, it's kind of hard to tell on a camera sometimes how loud things are, but uh, the decibel meter is, you know, pretty pretty accurate as far as showing what a real sound level is. It doesn't show the quality, like is it high pitched or low pitched, but at least it shows the overall sound level. So up at top are some screenshots from um, some earlier sound testing that I did on the one inch exhaust right here. And I did a sound test right at the tip of this flexible pipe, which would have been right here, but before it's connected to the, the muffler. And it was about 94 decibels, a few inches from the end of that pipe. When I plugged it into my original Franken muffler here and just did an, a test a few inches away from the muffler, um, it was about 74, 75. Um, so that's where I came up with a 20 decibel drop. Um, it is important before you start doing these tests that you make the rest of the generator as quiet as possible. So that's why I did the muffler testing last after I'd quieted everything else I could about the generator with the generator shed, including putting some baffles over these little outlets here and, and the inlet vents. Um, then the loudest thing left was the exhaust note. This way you can find out if you're really being effective with your sound deadening attempts because the only thing left is the exhaust. So again, the original went from 94 to 74. Now, I got a rude awakening when I tested the two inch pipe because it's wider, it's straighter, it's shorter. It actually let quite a bit more sound out of the pipe. So at the tip of the pipe, just a few inches away, it was a whopping 100 decibels. That's quite a bit louder than um, the 94 decibels that was coming out of the pipe up here, right here. But the good news is that once I hooked it up to the muffler, it was actually about the same. In this case, 73 decibels. The, the big difference was actually how well I got the lid to fit. Up here with a single bungee, it wasn't fitting quite as well and a little bit of sound was escaping right here. With the newer one, the two inch one, uh, I actually had two bungee cords and I had a lot better fitting lid and I adjusted the insulation that touches the lid to be a little more effective so it would stop any rattling and any escaping um, noise and, and air that came out of the, the sides here. So that was a little more effective at, at stopping any noise escaping the lid. So that's a good place to focus on if you're getting any excess rattling. For a little closer look on the internals, I actually took a piece of that rock wool. I sort of shaped it like the lid and uh, made sure that it was pressing pretty firmly against that. And then again, I used two bungee cords. I think in the future, uh, I might make a little modification and um, put some additional anchor points here around the uh, trash can and use some screws um, to actually cinch down the top a little bit more, maybe make a little wooden frame that will pull the lid down nice and tight and eliminate any leakage and any rattling. But uh, that's probably overkill. 
as long as you can keep it from rattling and keep the air from coming out, I think you'll be in pretty good shape um, and it will sound pretty good. All right, on to the parts list. Um, you guys can pause this if you need to, take a look. Um, some of these pieces aren't the exact pieces that I used, but for the most part they are. Um, this piece here I didn't have listed, it's just the end of a one inch pipe that I cut off and ground down. And that's the part that I had welded onto the muffler for the generator. Um, I couldn't find an exact list for this reduction bushing, but here's a similar one. Um, this one is stainless steel, you don't have to go with stainless steel, but the idea is it's a um, two inch male to one inch female thread reducing bushing. So um, again, it doesn't have to look exactly like that, but it'll have a one inch hole and it'll, um, with threading on the inside and it'll have a two inch hole with threading on the outside. So that's what you want. The next piece was just a conduit coupling. Um, and that's what I used to connect that to that threaded piece, and they just screw onto each other. Um, here's the piece right here. This piece was a um, compression connector for conduit. Here's the piece right here. I think this is from the Home Depot uh, website. You can find them uh, at different locations, but this was from the, the conduit section of the store. Again, you could use regular pipe, you could use other types of fitting like a set screw fitting. I just found that this one fit the most snug and uh, had the least air leakage. Now I should uh, mention that this flexible pipe has a two inch outside diameter. Now most pipe is listed at two inch inside diameter. Um, so tubing and pipe are measured a little bit different. So this connector is really made for a uh, conduit that's about two and an eighth outside diameter. So this, this was a little wiggly even when I tightened it up. So what I ended up using was this product from 3M. Um, it's foil tape, but it's 600 degree foil tape. Uh, don't use your standard foil tape because that's good to about 200 degrees. Um, this specifically says right here, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So. I figured that should be enough for most of the application. Um, because this is two inch pipe, it isn't getting nearly as hot as the one inch pipe was getting because there's a little more um, air that can flow around it and uh, it doesn't have, have quite the time to heat this pipe up as much as the one inch pipe. Um, so even if this uh, starts to melt or something, it probably will just get soft first and still maintain this connection. Um, it's really just a pressure fit anyway. Um, the pipe's not going anywhere because it's actually pressed against here at one end and against the uh, external Franken muffler on the other end. The pipe that I ended up using um, was this one. I think I got it from eBay. Um, so here's the exact piece. It was originally six feet. I think I have it cut down to just a little over three feet long. So um, uh, I have a little bit left over for any other projects. So. Those are the pieces I used. Again, you don't have to use those. These are just what I used in case you want to get started and want to find something similar. Um, the parts that I used from the muffler, uh, this is updated from the version one list. I, I gave a whole build rundown in the original Franken muffler build video on how I built it and the parts that I used. These are just the updated parts. So again, a trash can, I used a 20 gallon trash can here. You could use a 30 gallon or even a 55 gallon drum. Uh, the perforated pipe right here down the middle, uh, I used this one, a two inch by 24 inch, which was about 30 bucks. You could go bigger or you could even substitute a perforated pipe with some wire mesh that you just roll into a tube. Uh, it will accomplish essentially the same thing. Basically it's to keep the um, uh, insulation from impeding on the path of the exhaust as it goes through the muffler um, and also let the sound energy out into the insulation so that it can absorb it. Uh, this external piece here, in this picture I actually had a set screw connector but I, I ended up swapping that out for a compression connector which I've sort of explained before. The next piece here is a conduit connector just like I've used in other locations. And another set screw connector. I couldn't find this particular one, but here's a similar one at Home Depot. 
and it serves the same purpose. Um, again, it doesn't really matter. The reason I ended up with this particular setup is that it was the right length. So um, this fit really well and it has a little wiggle room right here so that I can slide it in and out as you're screwing this on uh, with the insulation and everything here. Um, it's pretty easy to take on or, or take off and put on. So that was it. I mentioned this piece before. Um, it was from Summit Racing, two inch uh, outside diameter and a four inch radius for this curve. And I ended up cutting it off kind of right here um, so that it doesn't stick too far down. Again, I didn't want to waste any of this surface area for this perforated pipe um, where the exhaust is just staying inside the tube. I wanted to maximize that sound absorption um, surface area. Back to the shed itself, if you watch the original shed build, um, I got lots of questions about, well, what was this part and what was that part and where can I get it? So uh, I'll start up here. The fan that I used was this particular one. It's a 12 inch fan, 940 cubic feet per minute. Um, if I had to do it again, I might go with a 14 inch fan with a higher cubic feet per minute rate. Um, this one sounds pretty impressive, almost a thousand cubic feet, and the shed itself is 70 cubic feet. So in theory, um, that could replace that air about uh, 15 times in a minute, so every four or five seconds. But as we know, airflow through a shed probably isn't that straightforward. It's probably going from one side to the other, kind of in the middle, and then the corners are a little more stagnant. So um, more airflow is better in this case. On the inlet side, I actually used this gable louver vent, which on a house you would normally see here uh, up in the top of the gable. So the reason I picked it is because it has downward facing louvers uh, to keep the rain out. And it already had mesh uh, installed to keep you know, bugs and mice and things from getting into the shed. So it was kind of an all-in-one and I didn't have to put additional screening over it. Um, or waterproof it in, in another manner. So it was kind of ready to go um, for the, the inlet side. Um, they make a 12 by 12, which would sort of match the fan, but I wanted a little more surface area here to let as much air in as possible. Now I do cover these, both the fan outlet and the air inlet with a baffle uh, that I explain in both of those videos about the Franken muffler and the shed build. So take a look at that if you want to see how I built the baffles. Um, another piece that I used was a dust collector blast gate. Um, not a f I haven't seen this used too often, but I use it to pass um, electric cords and uh, maybe a propane line in and out of the shed. And then when it's not in use, I can actually close the, the door here and seal up the shed. Um, and actually, even after I pass the cords through, I can close that door a little bit, and um, and it makes a minimal sized hole for sound to get out. Uh, or I could open it up to make more airflow. Either either way, it was a convenient way to put a door into the side of the shed where I could pass things inside and out. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what a dust collector blast gate is, since a lot of people didn't know what it was. The insulation I used on the inside of the shed was this Rockwell Comfort Board uh, 80, which is um, two feet by four feet and then an inch and a half thick. Um, it's not available everywhere. I got mine at Lowe's, but not every Lowe's has it. You might need to mail order it or check around. Um, there are other similar products from Rockwell, um, like Roxol, um, which is the parent company, um, Pro Rocks, um, but basically it's a semi-rigid insulation material, and it's specifically made for sound deadening uh, properties as well as insulation. So it works pretty well. And since it's mineral wool, it's got the fire rating of 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, which I was looking for. The vent that I use to go in and out of the shed um, for the two inch version is this class B three inch vent. Uh, this one was 24 inches long. I ended up cutting it in half and only using about a foot of it. I could have left the full length, um, but it looked a little awkward, so that's why I cut it in half. Um, and I used a, a three inch hole saw in the shed to make a perfect circle, and it slipped right in there. 
Um, I'll discuss this one just a bit, but I use this particular screw, um, which is a self-piercing number 10 by two inch screw and an inch and a quarter washer to hold the rock wool to the side of the shed. So a little more on that one. Um, the reason I went with a two inch screw is because the rock wool itself was an inch and a half. And I kind of calculated that I needed about a half inch more to pierce the inner wall of the shed, which is kind of right here, uh, but not poke out the outside of the shed since it's a dual wall construction. The other tricky thing about this is these screws don't really have to support the weight of the rock wall because the rock wall is actually sitting on the floor of the shed. It just needs to hold it to the wall um, so that it's always touching the wall. Um, but the sheds, if you've ever worked with these sheds, have a lot of bumps on them. So there's flat surfaces and then there's indentations. So before I would actually put a piece of rock wool on the wall, I would make an, a little mark on the on the shed wall where I could still see it on where the, the flat surfaces would be so I could screw into this flat surface instead of a hole. Um, so be careful that you do that. The good thing about the rock wool is it has these lines on it. So if I made a, say a mark right here, I could use this line to go down and make another hole in a similar location. So that was actually fairly convenient. Um, so I frequently ask questions. We're at the frequently asked questions part of the, um, of the video where I'm gonna answer some of the questions that I got from my other videos. Um, I got a ton of these questions, so I figured I'd ask, answer the most popular one. And the first one is, what the heck is a dust collector blast gate? Um, you can see it in the video down here, and I have cables going in and out, and then I can shut the door on top of it to kind of minimize that hole. And when I don't have the cables coming in and out, um, I can just shut it all the way, and it seals up the the shed. And here's here's the actual piece that I bought. But basically, a dust collector blast gate is is part of a uh, dust collector system, which you, is just a really big vacuum uh, system that you use mostly in like wood shops and things like that. And this vacuum can be connected through semi-permanent hoses, you know, PVC pipe um, that can be three inches, four inches, six inches, even eight inches. I've seen. Um, but to get the maximum vacuum um, on any particular piece of equipment, you can open that blast gate and close all the other ones, and that maximizes the vacuum to suck up the sawdust from this particular piece of equipment. And then when you're, you're done with that, you close that one and you open another one, and you can use it to suck up all the, the sawdust from this other one. So it just makes the dust collection system more efficient. And it has nothing to do with passing electrical cables in and out, but I have these really big 50 uh, amp cables that are almost as big as your fist. So I couldn't use a standard uh, box that you would typically get to um, go through the wall that was uh, for electrical stuff. So I needed something bigger. And I saw this in another video. I thought it was a great idea. So I used it. And so feel free to use that idea. All right, so here we have um, the generator that uh, I have, which is the Westinghouse WGen 9500DF, which is dual fuel. And uh, out of the box, it'll run on gasoline or propane. But I got a lot of people asking me, can it run on natural gas? So I'm not an expert on this generator, but I do know a little bit about it. So um, you can buy a kit that uh, will run on natural gas. Uh, it does cost you a little bit extra and you have to install it. Um, the downsides of natural gas is it doesn't have quite as much energy per volume as propane, just as propane doesn't have quite as much energy per volume as gasoline. Um, natural gas is comes in, obviously, a gaseous form. Liquid propane is a liquid, and gasoline, obviously, is a liquid. So there's um, some issues with transporting natural gas. So usually your deciding factor is whether you have natural gas line already plumbed to your house. If you do, it's not too expensive to run it out to your generator. If you don't, it can be quite expensive to get a natural gas line installed in your home, uh, turn on the utilities, that kind of thing. 
it can be pretty good in a power outage situation, assuming the gas doesn't get turned off um, because you have this constant supply and you don't have to go refill a gasoline tank or a propane tank. Um, so that's kind of nice for a standby generator, assuming it's not a kind of situation like with frozen pipes where it can get um, cut off for everybody in the neighborhood. But um, propane is a little um, more energy dense. It's more refined. Natural gas is methane uh, and some other components, including propane and butane and ethane. Um, but it's, that's refined down to be uh, propane. Um, also, propane is a little more portable, which was, in my case, I needed a portable generator. The, the backup generator piece is sort of a, uh, a secondary use in my case, so I needed it to remain portable. And, of course, the natural gas isn't really portable, uh, but the propane is. You just get a propane tank or two and take it with you. Obviously, gasoline is fairly portable, but it's also the least uh, efficient as far as you know burning. So it, it's smelly. Um, it can gum up if it gets uh, water in the, the fuel. And you usually just don't have any of those problems with your carburetor uh, if you stick with the propane. So that's why I went with propane on my setup, but it might not be appropriate for your use. All right, another question I got was, can you just let the exhaust from the generator exit into the interior of the shed and won't this help with sound level? So you could go that way, but I definitely wouldn't recommend it. So there's a couple issues there. You're releasing the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide into the shed, which can not only be dangerous, but it makes your, um, makes your generator run less efficiently. Also, you're dumping a lot of heat into that shed. The exhaust itself can be from 300 to 600, maybe even higher, and that's a lot of work to put on your fan. And at the end, what happens if the fan stops? So uh, it's hard enough to cool that <laughs> generator anyway. And if it gets too hot, the fan can, can turn off, the breaker can trip, uh, a whole bunch of things can happen and, and bad things happen when the fan stops uh, working in your shed. So uh, I would caution folks here. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I just run the generator in my garage. Well, if it's a detached garage that you might be able to get away with that, never do that on an attached garage because the, the danger of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide is just too high. Um, I also see a lot of people put them right under their windows, um, and I can't recommend that either. That can be a very um, uh, problematic setup, and you can uh, poison yourself if you do that for too long. All right, this is a pretty popular question, and I can't say that I have a lot of experience with it, but I do have some opinions on it. The question is, how about using a bucket of water for the muffler like an outboard motor? Well, if you're familiar with outboard motors, um, they actually use the water itself as a muffler and also as a coolant. So um, when the outboard motor is running, it sucks up water, circulates it through the engine as a coolant, dumps it back out, but it also uh, directs the exhaust um, out, out through the water so that it acts as a natural muffler itself. But what you do get is a lot of gurgling. So when you're idling a uh, uh, outboard motor, it goes blah, blah, blah. So you don't, that's not the most pleasant of sounds. So the other issue that comes here is an outboard motor is designed to work with that. Um, and at, at high speed, you actually have the moving water, which doesn't provide quite as much back pressure. The whole point of these upgrades that I did to my um, muffler and exhaust setup were to decrease back pressure. Now water has a lot more pressure and mass than air does. So uh, if you don't have an engine that's designed to use water as a muffler, um, it's gonna have a little bit of a problem pushing that exhaust out through uh, a bucket of water because well, water is a lot heavier and it's harder to push out of the pipe than air is. So if we had problem with back pressure with just a curvy pipe, you're going to have a lot more with a bucket of water. There's a couple of other problems here as well, other than the generator not being designed to work with um, water as a muffler. And that is the hot exhaust will eventually 
evaporate that water and you have to keep refilling your bucket. Uh, it's not a big problem in a lake uh, because you don't care if it evaporates. You have plenty more water. Um, also, in the end, you have this gurgling motorboat sound. And my whole idea behind the quiet shed and the quiet muffler was to keep it quiet. And personally, even though it re might reduce the volume, you still get this glug, glug, glug motorboat sound, which I would probably find even more annoying than the sound of a generator. So if you've seen my original sound tests and uh, the shed build, you'll find that the, the final result sounded a little more like a, an air conditioner running, which a lot of people are used to. I don't think you would necessarily be uh, real happy with the glug, glug, glug sound uh, coming from your um, generator. But that's personal choice, up to you. Uh, another question I got was, how did you cut the holes for the vents and the fan in the plastic shed? I used a little something called an oscillating multi-tool with a plunge cut um, blade here. So basically, you can just push it straight into the plastic, and it goes through that resin just like butter. So um, you can make really nice straight cuts. These corner cuts, you can go right up to the corner and plunge it in there and plunge it down here. And it's really good for square cuts especially, but you can do angle cuts as well. Um, I usually just pushed it into the, the shed and then sort of went at a 45 degree angle to cut the, the lines. And it worked really well. But keep in mind, this thing uh, oscillates at a very high frequency and it will shake the entire shed and make a really annoying and very loud sound. So wear ear protection if you use this on a plastic shed uh, or else you will have some ringing ears for a couple days. Um, I get a lot of questions about these big off-road tires that I put on my um, generator. I did the, that for a couple of reasons. Um, it makes the generator easier to push uh, when I'm using it out in the woods um, or over you know, rough ground. But it also, um, I had to raise the generator up and widen the stance a little bit so that I could fit my uh, motorcycle ramp and in this case, generator ramp into the back of my truck. So it's just wide enough and tall enough where I can fit my ramp underneath. Um, and a third benefit that I wasn't really planning at the time was it actually cuts down on the vibration that gets transferred to the ground from the generator itself and helps absorb some of that vibration. So I've had a few people comment that this is probably a pretty big reason why the generator shed works pretty well is these big pneumatic tires. So a lot of reasons that um, I installed them, you certainly don't have to. Um, this is the piece that I used. It was a Harbor Freight piece. I think at the time they were only like eight bucks a piece. Um, I think they're quite a bit more than that now as prices have gone up. The other question I get about this is, uh, how did you attach it? the wheels to the generator. And I actually used the stock holes uh, from the legs that came on the generator, and I just drilled the hole up through the wood. And these actually had nuts right here um, welded to the frame, and I just used those. I think these are M6s or M8s, I can't recall. Um, so I didn't actually have to drill any holes right here. I did have to drill one hole in the frame right here. Um, on this side and the back side. And then here I just used conduit connector and went over the frame rail and just held it down. It seems really solid. The wheels aren't going anywhere. If I had a choice, I might not have used wood. Um, this was mostly to see if it would work, uh, and it seems to. Uh, I might have some concerns about the wood, especially right under the muffler uh, where it gets very hot, but I might put some heat shielding there. Alternatively, you could make it out of uh, steel tubing, that kind of thing. Uh, I just needed something that was at least, I think this is four inches wide, so that's why I use a two by six. Also, this generator is about 230 pounds, so I wanted a big piece of wood to go here. So that's the reasoning behind the wheels. Um, get asked quite often how, or how did I measure the sound? Um, this is the particular decibel meter that I used. It seems to work pretty well. You can also get a free app on your phone. It works just fine for most pur purposes. I wanted to get a little more accurate as the microphone on my uh, phone didn't seem to be super accurate all the time, especially at very high 
noise levels, it seemed to kind of cut out. So I wanted something that would go up to, uh, in this case, it was 130 decibels. Um, and I've used this for other projects as well. All right, so now for some of the dumber questions that I get, but um, in the original video, I started out by saying that I bought the generator to charge some electric motorcycles. And the question is, did that idiot in the video really say that? And he said, doesn't uh, this person have to turn in his tree hugger card? Well, yes, I did say that. And these actually happen to be the electric motorcycles I'm talking about. They're Ulta Redshift electric motorcycles. Um, and, and they have a pretty big battery in them. So what I didn't say that I is that I would use the generator to charge them at home. That would be pretty stupid since I have an electrical outlet for that. What I do use it for is when I go out riding at the motocross track or out camping is I, I use the generator to charge the bikes. And I needed a big generator because these two bikes together pull about as much amperage as a Tesla does. This is kind of a joke picture here, pulling a generator to charge a Tesla, but the idea was kind of the same uh, if you assume that I bought the generator to charge my electric bikes. Only off-grid, I swear, folks. So household backup power was sort of a secondary purpose of this and thus the generator shed. So um, again, I needed to keep my generator portable and I needed to um, make sure that I could load it in the back of my truck, which is why I had those big wheels and a wide stance. The generator literally sits right up here in front of um, the bikes between the two front tires and in front of my tie downs here and straddling my uh, ramp. So it works pretty well. It's a tight fit, but it fits. Um, in the end, um, you know, you might think it's kind of dumb to charge an electric bike with a gas generator, but you do what you need to do to um, power your devices. You know, you need to get your energy in the right form for you to use it. In my case, I didn't buy the electric bikes to be green. Uh, I bought them because they're really cool bikes and they have a lot of advantages over an internal combustion bike. Uh, they start right up. I never have to do oil changes or uh, other maintenance on the bike that I would normally have to do on an internal combustion bike. Um, I don't have to rebuild carburetors. I don't have stinky gas. I don't uh, have to rebuild the engine after 50 or 100 hours. I actually have 300 hours on two of these bikes, and uh, all I've ever had to do is change the the tires and the chain. So um, maintenance-wise, they're a breeze. But you do what you need to do to charge them when you're out and you don't have an electric plug-in. Uh, also, I needed a very big uh, generator, I think I mentioned before, because I need to charge these at the same time and a smaller uh, generator like a, even a quiet Honda inverter like an EU 7000 IS is not big enough to charge these bikes at the same time or else I would have went that direction and not worried about a quiet shed. So lastly, um, back to the point that you need the energy in the form that you need it. <laughs> um, people use electric gas pumps to pump their gas into their internal combustion cars. So you use what you need to use to get that energy. And sometimes you might have to jump through a couple hoops to get it in the form that you need it. All right, another question. Is that idiot really wearing a helmet in the shed build video? Or does he just have a huge head? Well, yes, I am that idiot and I am wearing a helmet in that shed build video. Basically, uh, I already had a motocross helmet with a chin mount for my GoPro, so I decided to use it. Uh, it works pretty well because it leaves your hands free. Um, it gives a good point of view, so wherever I look, I know where I'm, I'm pointing the camera, um, and it leaves both hands free. And I didn't want to trip and fall down trying to juggle a decibel meter, a camera, and everything else. So the bad point of it, though, is, yes, I had to wear a helmet, and the mic is literally like three inches from my mouth. So... Uh, it wasn't really made for that. GoPros um, kind of have sensitive mics in that area. It works great for motocross where you have background sounds for uh, the motorcycle and it drowns out your voice. It did not work quite as well with um, <laughs> with low background ambient noise. And I'm sorry for the sound quality on that video. It picked up every little noise 
and it didn't really sound so great. All right, uh, another common question that I get is how much did the shed cost? Well, it probably cost me a little less than it might cost you if you paid full price for the shed. Um, one of the things that I did mention is I got the shed secondhand, um, but it was still in the box. So the person bought it but never put it together. So that was only $150, but I have priced them lately, and they're up in the $500 range. So if you throw in tax and maybe even shipping, that could be really expensive. And you could probably put $700 into a shed like that before any of the other upgrades. But I wanted to go through these um, parts um, so that you had a general idea of what costs uh, I put into the shed. So my estimate is about $700, not counting things like extension cords and generator interlocks um, for my electrical panel and stuff like that that aren't really related to the shed, just having a generator that you want to plug into your house, uh, those were necessary. So parts, uh, the attic fan was about 70, the vent was 25, the blast gate was 15, the flexible pipe was 30. I have about 100 bucks into miscellaneous pipe and conduit parts. Uh, if you know exactly what you want, you could have done that a little cheaper than what I did, but I had to buy miscellaneous parts to figure out what would fit and put them all together and see what was the right length, et cetera. Um, the rock wool, I actually used two packages of rock wool. That was $120 total. The kill mat was the um, vinyl that I put on the uh, lid of the shed. That was about $30. Um, screws and washers were $15. I used a little bit of foam insulation around the holes that I cut, which was about $20. The baffles I just made out of spare wood and spare insulation, so it didn't cost me anything. But uh, if you had to buy some MDF uh, for the wood and um, insulation, that might cost you 100 bucks to build those. Uh, wood is not cheap anymore. So if you have some extras, you can, you can build them out of spare parts. They don't have to be pretty. And then, of course, a metal garbage can was $30 in that case. All right, then we come to the um, Franken muffler. Um, I did purchase some additional insulation, the, the batting style of mineral wool, um, which I go into in the version one video if you want to see some more details on that. That was about 50 bucks per pack. I only used a couple sheets of that. The perforated pipe was 50. Some wire mesh that I put at the bottom uh, was 15. And that's kind of the total for the shed and the muffler. Now there's some extra parts that I didn't really count in my $700 total that were $300 for the extension cords. They're 50 amp extension cords. Those things are really pricey, really heavy. Um, I would have had to buy those whether I had a shed or not just because I had quite a long run from where I could place my generator to where I could plug it into my garage where my um, electrical panel is. There's also the cost to hook it up to your electrical panel, which in my case was a generator interlock kit and an outlet box. Um, and uh, that can be quite pricey. You could also go with a transfer switch, which is even more, um, or something called a Jenner lock, which is even more pricey, like a thousand bucks, and that isn't even installed. So those weren't necessarily tied to the shed or the um, or the muffler itself, but they're things that you'll have to take into account if you're going to connect a generator to your house electrical system, unless you know how to do electrical work. Some other things that I'm doing um, that I haven't done yet, but I have the pieces are a trickle charger for my battery. Um, I've seen a lot of people use this in other videos. It even has the right connector to connect to my battery. You put this on the lid of your generator shed or the roof, um, put a hole in the wall and, and run it to where your battery is, and that will keep your generator uh, battery charged when you want to use it. And the other piece is um, heat wrap for the flexible pipe. I have this, I just haven't put it on. It should actually help with keeping the heat in the generator shed down, and it will probably help a little bit absorb some of the sound um, that, um, escapes through the pipe, you know, just from it rattling and things like that. 
do be careful when you put this stuff on. It is fiberglass. It can be itchy. It can get in your fingers and in your eyes if you rub them. So um, I think the instructions actually say to soak this in water and wear um, rubber gloves um, so that you um, don't irritate your skin and, and that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a pain to work with, but when it gets done, it should help considerably with the heat and the sound on that flex pipe. Um, another big project, um, I may make another video on this, I'm not sure yet. I actually had another design for the Franken muffler that's probably the Gen 3, and I kind of call it a spiral flow muffler. Basically, I took layers of the rock wool, um, and I cut it into a shape like this with a hole. You can see down here in the corner. Um, and I start stacking it up, and I rotate each one a little bit. So it makes a spiral. There's a lot of surface area in here. But my main idea here was uh, I wanted to increase the flow of the muffler. And these are huge. Um, you might be able to see down here, this is a four-inch circle. This is a four-inch circle, and it's four inches wide. So it's essentially 10 inches long, four inches wide. You can stick your arm down this hole. Um, but it will spiral about one time around um, the garbage can as it comes up. Um, and each little corner it makes here absorbs a little more sound, etc. Uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, the trickiest thing was what to do at the top. So I, I had a couple variations here. Uh, the exhaust will come in here. Um, this is the one when I was trying to make the flow maximized. and. It's just a big sound chamber and then it goes down. That actually let out a little too much sound. This one was much better. I kind of put a little spiral here and then it has to turn a corner. Um, it's fairly gradual there. Um, and then it spirals down about one full 360 degree turn. This one worked much better, but it does have a little bit more back pressure. But I could literally hook a leaf blower to this and it would blow out the bottom without too much pressure. So. The idea that it would decrease back pressure was pretty good. Um, total of sound was slightly um, more than my version one and version two mufflers. So um, I'm, I'm gonna keep working on that one. I don't know if it's a better answer. I think the, the version two muffler is probably more than sufficient for what most people are looking at, especially if they don't have a muffler or a generator quite as loud as the one that I have. So. Stay tuned, I might make a video on this. Um, I mostly included this just to kind of show what I'm thinking about, um, some other ideas that you might want to implement. Um, th this whole video series is really about giving you guys ideas on how you can quiet your generator or, or other devices as well, like uh, air compressors, things like that, work on the same principle, just reverse. Um, you guys don't have to build you know, exactly what I built here. These are just ideas, parts that I use, experiments that I've had, and things that seem to have worked pretty well. So that was the whole point of these videos. And really thank you guys for, for watching and staying uh, tuned into my channel. Uh, I really didn't intend this to be a huge uh, video series. I thought maybe a couple hundred people might see it. And now 100,000 views later, a lot of folks seem to be interested in shed videos and uh, quiet generators and things like that. So uh, if you like this one, hit like, um, subscribe uh, in case you want to see some more videos. I do occasionally post other things like uh, other stuff on electronics, electric motorcycles, and kind of geeky stuff like that. So thanks for tuning in. I know this was a long video, but um, I did have a lot of questions, so I figured I'd just answer them all at the same time. And thank you guys for tuning in. Bye.